Hi, so today we're going to be starting a new section of the course, uh, which is conserving and managing the environment. What has conservation policy and strategies looked like over time? Have they worked? What's been the result for the environment and also the people? And what kind of assumptions are these conservation policies built on? Um, so to kick off this section today, we'll be talking about a well-known concept, which is the tragedy of the commons. Um, we left off we looking at different examples of cultures throughout space and time. How have they interacted with their environments and has it been sustainable or not? And so now we'll be moving into conserving and managing the environment. Um, more specifically, what have Western cultures done in terms of conservation policy? And so we'll talk about the tragedy of the commons today and we'll look at an actual example of resource collapse of the tragedy of the commons in the case of the cod fishery off the Atlantic coast. So tragedy of the commons. Um, first, let's talk about fundamentals of common pool resource use. Um, and so what is the relationship between private vice, pursuing one's own private individual interests, and the public benefit. There's two ways to look at the relationship between private versus common interests when looking at common pooled resources. Um, this is the invisible hand and also something called social dilemmas. So first, the invisible hand. And this is a famous concept in economics. This is Adam Smith's invisible hand, which he wrote about in The Wealth of Nations in 1776. This is this framework is what underlies laissez-faire capitalism actually um, and so the idea is smith said that rational individuals acting in their own capacity right rationally um, in pursuing their own self-interest in benefiting themselves either through profit or whatever their endeavors may be um, this will actually benefit all of society um, the individual in pursuing their own individual self-interest rationally is led as it was by an invisible hand so that it results in this trickling down and benefiting all of society. Um, and so let me give you some examples to sort of expound what I mean. Um, when you go to the grocery store, you're done getting all of your stuff and you've got your beer, whatever else, and your apples, and you head to the checkout line, which line do you pick? Do you go to the longest one? Do you go to the one with the old lady in it with two carts of stuff and a bunch of coupons? <laughs> or no offense. Or do you go to the shortest line that's going to get you out the quickest? And most of us go to the shortest line. There's no real rule um, regulating that. But in acting in our own self-interest, I want to get out of the store quicker. I'm going to go to the shorter line. And in this way, it benefits everyone. Instead of having everyone stand in one long line, making it slower for everyone, reducing the profits the store can make, everyone, without being directed to do so, in pursuing their own self-interest, goes to the shortest line. Everyone gets out of the store quicker. And the store makes money from this. Okay, so sort of simple example. Another example, um, think about, and this can go both ways, so don't get upset. Um, you're in traffic and you're merging onto the freeway. Let's say there's two lanes on the on-ramp merging onto the freeway. Um, and so you, everyone sort of, everyone uses, you don't all stay in the same lane. People use multiple different lanes to merge on because in California, there's too many people. If we all stayed in the same lane, it would take forever to get on the freeway. So everyone acting in their own self-interest gets into the shorter merge lane. And in this way, we can all get on the freeway quicker. Again, I realize that that can go both ways. So I'm using this as a hypothetical. Um, another example, the green lawn on the homeowner. Why? What's the purpose of having a nice yard? Um, for an individual home owner. One, it benefits the individual, right? It raises the property values. But what else does this do when an individual maintains their property and it looks nice? What else does this do for all the other properties around that area, all the other people? Um, it also raises the surrounding property values. 
This is the reason that we have homeowners associations, right? To make sure the opposite doesn't happen. Um, everyone has to paint their house a certain color, keep their lawn a certain manicured way, et cetera, um, so that no one's yard looks like shit and drives down property values, right? So in this way, in pursuing your own self-rational interest, keep your yard nice to keep your own property values up, this trickles down, benefits the surrounding properties, also raises the property value there. Um, again, this can go the opposite way. Um, Innovation is another example of what Adam Smith was talking about. People invent new objects, films, technology, entertainment um, for their own personal gain, for money, um, for satisfaction, whatever it may be driving them. That's good for the individual, but also this new object or technology or art also benefits the society as a whole. We all get to use this stuff. This is what the invisible hand is. This idea that private vice in seeking your own self-interest rationally will result, trickle down and benefits for the rest of society. Again, the idea in economics, if you allow individuals to seek their own self-interest unregulated, i.e seek economic profit unregulated, this will benefit society as a whole. This is trickle down economics. This is Reaganomics, right? Give the money to the top and those people at the top will create businesses and new technologies and jobs and things for the rest of us that in this way it will benefit all of us. It'll raise the living standards of everyone, right? Um, there's zero, just so we're clear, there's zero empirical support for trickle-down economics actually working. In fact, 40 years of failed trickle-down economics in the past 40 years of U.S. economic policy would suggest um, that this does not work. Um, and there's an important reason for this because Smith did not say this was invariably true, this idea that private vice equals public virtue. What he said is that it's only true if the individual reaps all the benefits of their in seeking their own self-interest, so creating a new technology or uh, creating a new business, if the individual reaps all the benefits, but also bears all the costs of that endeavor, right? Then you get the invisible hand. When the individual reaps all the benefits, but does not bear all the costs of their actions that they are benefiting from, the opposite situation results, something called a social dilemma, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And so Adam Smith never said this was invariably true, even though politicians today on particularly one side of the aisle use his economic concepts to justify laissez-faire, meaning completely unregulated capitalist economic exchange. Um, again, because the idea is you don't regulate it, let people compete on the open market in their own self-interest, this will trickle down and benefit us all. Again, Smith didn't say this was always true. It's only true if the individual reaps the benefits but also bears the cost. And keep in mind, in global capitalist economies, these individuals do not bear the cost of their actions. That cost is shared among all of us. Um, this is the case with unregulated capitalism, the environmental, the social costs that go into that production, those aren't bared by the producer. Those are spread across other populations and other environments, right? Um, and so, but nonetheless, uh, Smith's concept of the invisible hand is still used today to justify laissez-faire unregulated capitalism. Again, even though 40 years of failed economic policy, increasing inequality and poverty would show um, that it, again, it's not empirically supported. This doesn't actually work. The individual has to bear the costs too. Okay, and so when the individual doesn't bear all the costs, when it's shared among everyone else, this is the opposite situation. This is what we call social dilemmas. So social dilemmas, this is a situation where the individual's decision, excuse me, the individual's decision to maximize their own short-term self-interests um, economically or whatever it may be, um, they're doing it for themselves. And this leaves everyone else off in the community, that person's community, worse off than they were before. Um, so some, ex let's start with some just simple examples. Let's say you go to a concert, um, your favorite band, or I don't know what music you guys like. So let's say Bob Marley comes back from the dead and you're at a Bob Marley concert. And all of a sudden, um, let's just pretend you're sitting down, even though most of us probably don't sit down at concerts. You're sitting down, and all of a sudden, someone else right in front of you stands up. 
Um, and what starts what starts to happen? What does that sort of force everyone else to do? So in this case, the individual can now see better, but now everyone else around them can't really see at all, right? Forces them to either stand up or sort of sit there and not really be able to enjoy the show like they were before. Um, and so it's a social dilemma. In this case, the person standing up at the concert, it benefits them. It leaves everyone else at that Bob Marley concert worse off than they were before. Um, another example of a social dilemma. And again, these are all sort of hypotheticals, right? Um, it depends on the way we talk about it. Aggressive driving. Um, so people are, you know, late for work because they can't seem to leave the house on time. I might fall into this category. Uh, late for work, and I'm not, now I don't speed and tailgate, but the people are late, they're speeding, they're tailgating, they're cutting other people off um, to try to get to work on time. And this may, depends on how it works out, as long as they don't get a ticket or pulled over or an accident, this might benefit the individual. They're going to get to work quicker on time um, they're, because they're getting there quicker. But it's negative for the whole group, right? The people that are getting cut off um, that may get in an accident because of it, right? It leaves this person's individual action for themselves, leaves everyone else worse off. One other sort of simple example um, for those of you that don't have off street parking where you live and you've got to park on the street every time you come home and you come home and it's kind of late and which means it's harder to find parking. Maybe you live at North Park or South Park. And what has someone done? There's a space where you live There's on the street that there's room for two cars to park on the street. But what has someone done? They have parked their car in the middle of that space. So even though there's room for two cars, now there's not. Um, I've seen people do that. They like save a space for their spouse or something like that. Um, and so it's, or you park like that so no one else can park next to you. No one can get close to you or ding your car. Um, so you leave that, so you park in that whole space. It leaves you better off. Maybe you're saving parking for your partner, but it leaves everyone else in that community worse off. There's one less parking spot for everyone else to use. And this parking in this sense would be the common pooled resource, right? Something that we all are using. Um, let's step aside into biology for a second to talk about social dilemmas. Um, elk horns. Large elk horns are smart for the individual, beneficial from the perspective of natural selection, but larger elk horns are dumb for the group. They're bad, adversely affecting the group as a whole. Um, and so one thing, so we're talking about evolution for a minute. Um, in natural selection, evolution doesn't just occur at the level of the individual. Right. It occurs at the level of the cell, the level of the molecule and the level of the group even. Um, for example, cancer is a total evolutionary success story at the level of the cell, not at the level of the individual. Right. Um, unhindered cell growth and reproduction. That's essentially what cancer is. Um, if the goal of evolution is to reproduce and pass on your genes, then that's a success story from the level of the cell. But as we know, it's not good for the individual. Cancer kills us. Um, so you have different competing levels of selection. OK, and so um, elk are a polygamous species, meaning that males meet, mate with multiple different females. And so the result is males have to compete for access to females. Uh, this is typical of polygamous species. And so in elk populations, the males with the largest horns typically win. Originally, this was thought because of their superior weaponry, the larger horns, they can fight off other males. Um, now scientists think actually the larger horns aren't so much for fighting with other males, um, rather the large horns signal what we call a handicap. Um, Meaning that uh, it's not helping the elk fight, but the, the large horns are actually a burden, right? As you're trying to navigate through the forest, these horns get caught up in trees. It's difficult to escape wolves and other predators running through the forest, the larger the horns you have. Um, and so what the large horns, what scientists think now is the large horns aren't so much for fighting, but they signal to the females this handicap. Hey, look at me. Look how giant my horns are. They're a huge burden, a handicap, if you will. It makes me more visible to predators. It's difficult to escape from wolves running through the forest. Look at me with these giant horns, this huge handicap that I'm bearing, and I'm still making it. I'm still kicking ass. I'm still surviving. I'm still reproducing. So those large horns signal to the female, this guy's got good, healthy genes. Um, what we're talking about here is a corollary to natural selection, which is sexual selection. So in evolution, um, 
to survive and reproduce and thus pass on your genes in higher numbers to the next generation, you need to not just survive as an organism, but you need to also reproduce, thus passing on your genes. And so traits are selected for that help individuals survive, uh, get food, escape predation, but traits are also selected for that help them get mates access to reproducing and passing on their genes. And so the peacock's tail that you see on the slide, that always plagued Charles Darwin. How the hell is this giant beautiful tail adaptive from the perspective of natural selection? And the answer is, sexual selection. It doesn't, the tail doesn't help the peacock survive. It actually is a burden. It makes it more difficult to run away from predators. Um, and so what it is, is that it's a handicap. It signals to the female, again, look at me, I'm carrying around this huge tail, this total burden, it handicaps me and I'm still making it, I'm still surviving. My genes are good as fuck, you should mate with me. Um, sexual selection, this costly ornamentation signals to the females, I've got good genes, mate with me. And so that's kind of what's going on with the elk horns. The larger the elk horn, horns are, um, the larger the handicap, and the more it signals to the female, hey, um, come mate with me. Um, but what we have in the case of the elk horns is a case of runaway, runaway evolutionary arms race, basically. Um, so at the level of the individual, larger horns are good. It increases access to mates. But at the level of the group, as horns have gotten larger and larger, this has actually made the entire population of elk more vulnerable to predators. Um, actually, you could reduce elk horn size by half um, because it's relative size, not absolute size that matters in terms of signaling to females. And this would make everyone better off. It would increase security from predators. Um, but again, you see this competition, this social dilemma between um, individual benefits, sort of the large horns at the level of the individual for sexual selection and access to mates, but it leaves everyone else off in the population worse off um, because these large horns also result in increased predation. It's more difficult to run away from predators. So when individual decision makers, again, this is an example from evolution, but we can apply this socially as well. When individual decision makers reap all the benefits and also bear all the costs, we get Adam Smith's invisible hand in which private vice results in benefits for the group. However, when individuals reap all the benefits but only bear some of the costs, we end up with social dilemmas, right? Um, again, this is the case of the elk horns. horns. Um, the elk gets all the benefit of the large horns, only bears some of the cost um, that this defers onto the population in terms of increased predation. There's one other example in the reading for today that talks about tragedy of the commons, a short five, six page article. Um, another last example of a social dilemma is something called the prisoner's dilemma. And so it's sort of, it's sort of a famous example. You have two prisoners, they're in separate cells, they're in trouble, and they can't communicate with each other. If both confess to the crime, uh, they each get three years. If both stay quiet, if both cooperate, in other words, they each get one year. Or alternatively, if one defects, one sort of confesses or rats out the other, and the other stays silent, the one that defects and confesses walks free, the one that stays silent gets five years. But since the prisoners can't communicate or coordinate their strategy, neither one of them risks cooperation or silence. They don't risk the benefit of the group um, because if the other person doesn't stay silent, then the one that that does is going to get five years. So neither they can't communicate, neither risks cooperation or silence. They both end up confessing. And so they both end up getting three years, which is two more than each would have had if they both kept their mouth shut. So again, self-interest leaves everyone else at um, off, worse off in the community, including the self-interested individual in this case. Um, so social dilemmas, unlike the concept of the invisible hand, uh, do not generally benefit the whole group. They are a cost to the group. So in many pre-industrial societies, resources like pasture land, forests, fisheries, lakes were thought to be common pool resources. Uh, common pool resources are defined by two key criteria. One, exclusion is difficult meaning that it's hard to exclude others from using the resource because it's either too expensive um, to exclude them. This is the case with trying to monitor large national parks or large tracts of grassland. You just It's just too big. It can't really be done um, efficiently. Or exclusion is difficult. It's, it's hard to keep other people out 
um, because it's vir virtually impossible to monitor. This is sort of the case with many areas of our ocean um, and also our atmosphere polluting into the atmosphere. Um, very difficult to actually regulate that or exclude people from using it. And secondly, um, in common pooled resources, joint use involves subtractability, um, which means that each user's exploitation of the resource leaves less for the next person. And this fact led to Garrett Hardeen's Tragedy of the Commons 1968 paper. Uh, the Tragedy of the Commons, Hardeen's paper, is one of the most famous and cited papers in the history of science. Uh, he makes a very compelling argument. And what he proposes is that unregulated access to common property resources, such as fisheries or pasture land or forests, this results in unhindered resource exploitation and environmental degradation. The whole purpose of his paper, why he sort of wrote and developed Tragedy of the Commons, Hardeen was searching for some kind of hidden dynamic or mechanism that was responsible for the environmental destruction he was seeing at the time. And this is what led him to the tragedy idea. Um, and the basic message in his Tragedy of the Commons is humans have the, a deep flaw in their behavior. This is the tragedy. Um, the flaw is that we will always act in our own rational self-interest despite the potentially negative consequences for the rest of the group. Um, and so th this is the tragedy, the flaw will always act in our own self-interest despite the negative consequences for the group. And unless we, he said, unless we deal with this flaw, this tragedy in human behavior, it's gonna lead to our own destruction. And then he used the example of herdsmen grazing on a pasture commons to illustrate what he meant. And one thing to note here that's really important is um, a flaw in what Hardeen said. Humans have a deep flaw in their behavior, this, this tendency to always pursue our own self-interest. And that is very much a cultural trait, not a natural human trait, right? Um, the rugged, rugged individual, individual success um, over the group, um, competition. These are values held by many in American culture, but these are not necessarily universal human values. They're cultural values. If you look at other cultures like the Kung, um, they value the opposite, right? They don't value individualism. That's stigmatized. It is not boastful or something to be proud of when one person is full and another person goes hungry. That is not something to be proud of or seen as success. Um, so this idea that humans will always pursue their own self-interest to the detriment of the group, it's very much a cultural trait, an American value for some, that is not a human trait. And so what he said, again, using a uh, herdsman on pasture land, the pasture is the common uh, resource. And so recall, exclusion is difficult. It's really hard to keep others from using it or impossible. And also jo joint use involves subtractability. So uh, one person's use leaves less for the other. And why we typically in Western society see this as a problem is if one person can exploit as much as they want, they can't be excluded, they can use it as much as they want, um, then they and others have no real incentive to conserve that resource. Um, why am I going to be a virtuous conservationist when everyone else around me is exploiting the shit out of this pasture land and it's going to be gone soon? Um, and so the resource in this sense will inevitably become degraded those virtuous conservationists looking out for the good of the environment, um, they'll bear all the cost of the overgrazing or overfishing and none of the benefits. Um, so on the comic on the slide, um, imagine there are four shepherds who each own four sheep. They graze together on a commons that provides enough grass for 16 sheep. As long as each of the shepherds limit their flocks to four sheep, the commons will sustain them indefinitely. But one rational individual herdsman supposes what would happen if I got another sheep? The smart shepherd figures he can add a sheep to his flocks and get a positive benefit of plus one. All right, he says. And so think about it. The money, the products, the benefit from using the pasture for one more animal and selling one more animal that you've grazed on it, the benefits of that are all that herdsman's own. Um, the plus one that is all belongs to that individual herdsman. While the cost of overgrazing from this one extra sheep um, the negative effect of the overgrazing, uh, let's just say negative one, only a fraction of that cost is bared by the individual rational herdsmen. All of the herdsmen share that cost. 
right? While the negative effect of overgrazing a fraction of negative one is shared by all four of the shepherds. Why should I be such a chump, say the rest of the herdsmen? And so each rational herdsman concludes, I'll add another sheep too, right? Why should I be a chump? And then each adds another sheep, then another until there's no grass left on the commons. And so Hardeen says, ruin is the destination towards which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interests. Um, and so this is Hardeen's argument, right? In, in people pursuing their own self-interest, they reap all the benefits while that cost is bared, um, shared among the group. Um, therefore, everyone else in the group says, why should I be a chump? And they also start over-exploiting the commons. Um, and eventually this will result in degradation and destruction of the commons. Um, again, remember, valuing sort of individual success and profit over sustainability or the, the stability of the group, this is a cultural trait. This is not a natural human trait. And so there's several different possible tragic commons. Um, national parks are possibly subject to tragedy of the commons. This is one reason people argue that they should be and are regulated, right? The use of them is regulated so that they don't get destroyed. Um, forests, marine ecosystems like fisheries or coral reef systems, um, air and the atmosphere, also other types of commons, pollution, not just of the air, but also water, uh, soil, our oceans. Think about um, the amount of plastic in the ocean right now. That's a great example of a tragedy of the commons. Um, other types of ecosystems and all sorts of examples of potential tragic commons. And so Hardeen's argument is that these areas are, are going to be ruined if left subject to human devices. People will inevitably overexploit them because they can. Um, and so they can't be left unregulated. And the main solutions that people derived from Hardeen's argument was uh, in order to save the resource, to keep it from being overexploited, you need to either privatize it or create government regulation of that resource. Um, so the ideas behind privatization, now individuals own the resource and they have um, a vested interest in maintaining it. Right. As we know, this is not necessarily true. Think about logging and mining companies. Their goal is not sustainable resource use at all, but basically to just take take the resources and go right. Strip mining, essentially, um, or have the government regulate the resource um, so that it's managed so that overuse or over exploitation doesn't necessarily occur. And government management doesn't necessarily assure sustainable resource use either. Um, I mean, for example, under Donald Trump, they've slashed something like 60 out of 80 environmental protection laws. And I'm not talking like just like lowering emission standards on cars. I'm talking about they're getting rid of the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. Um, so government regulation doesn't assure sustainability either. But nonetheless, that people from Hardeen's argument assumed tragedy of the commons will always happen unless we privatize or regulate the resource. And so we're going to look at an actual case of resource collapse of in which Hardeen's argument sort of came true. Um, and that is off the coast of the Atlantic, the Atlantic coast um, of the cod fishery. And so the Atlantic cod fishery was one of the most uh, productive fisheries really in the world. It was one of the most important renewable resources in the world, cod. Uh, this guy, Mark Kurlansky, wrote a book, 1997, Cod, A Biography of the Fish That Changed the World. And he talks throughout the book about the use of cod, the history, its rise um, as an economic staple. And actually, he says that the lucrative cod trade, um, the economic activity that it eventually generated, um, it was so important that he credits the cod trade of New England with giving the colonies the economic wherewithal to basically go into the Revolutionary War and gain their independence. So a really important um, resource. Cod used to be abundantly located off the Grand Banks, here shown on the map, um, again, sort of North Atlantic. And here in this area, uh, what you're seeing is a rel there's a relatively shallow shelf in this area of the ocean, um, anywhere from 80 to sort of 300 feet in depth. 
And so also you have this cold Labrador current coming down from the north um, and a warm Gulf Stream current coming up from the south. The mixing of the cold and warm waters and also the shallow shelf, the shape of the ocean bottom here. The effect of that is it lifts all these nutrients up to the surface. And so these conditions have helped create one of the richest fishing grounds in the world. Um, it, it's possibly the most important or at least was one of the most productive fishing grounds in the world. Just for fun, it's also the uh, scene of the film The Perfect Storm, um, which is kind of outdated now with George Clooney. Um, and also, interestingly, in addition to the effect on nutrients, um, the raising of the nutrients that the mixing of the cold and the warm water has, the mixing of the water also causes fog in the area. And so this area is also noted for its proximity to the sinking of the Titanic. And so Kurlansky calls cod the fish that changed the world. Many of you have probably eaten cod. Um, if you've ever had fish and chips, cod is sort of the main fish in that often. And cod is a prolific fish, meaning it has really high reproductive rates. It's easy to catch and it's also a long lived fish. Um, all of these things make it a great resource to exploit. On top of the fact that it's very easy to preserve, cod has a low fat content, and so if you salt it, it will last for months. Um, this is good for the producer and the consumer. And the Basques may have exploited the Grand Banks 500 years before Columbus ever made it over to the New World. It's actually possible that Columbus found out about the New World from the Basques, from cod fishermen. The Basques in general, they were major traders of cod. Um, cod was a key food for Meatless Friday in Catholic Europe. Um, many of you might consider fish meat, as do I. Um, the reason it was considered meatless in Catholicism is because it was a cold-blooded animal. So when John Cabot or Giovanni Caboto discovered Newfoundland, the New World, and discovered being in quotes because obviously this area was not discovered by Europeans. Uh, people already inhabited it for thousands of years. Um, but when he discovered Newfoundland in 1497, there was over a thousand Basque fishing boats uh, in the area. It's truly one of, was one of the richest fisheries in the world. Um, cod is prodigious. It's immense. It's a big, large fish. Uh, it's a bottom dwelling fish. It forms massive schools that swim along with their mouths open and they devour everything that will fit down their gullets. Um, one fully mature female can produce up to 9 million eggs per year. So again, prolific, high reproductive rates. Um, so really it's no wonder that when John Cabot explored the North Atlantic in 1497, um, his crew, as you can see on the slide, just dropped baskets over the side of their boats to fish. Um, Kurlansky in his book uh, about cod says, if there ever was a fish made to endure, it is the Atlantic cod, the common fish, but it has among its predators man, an open mouth species greedier than the cod. After the 1497 discovery, um, there was another 500 year boom of cod fishing. For example, by 1508, 10% of the stuff in Portuguese ports was salted cod. That's within like a decade. By 1550, about 40 years later, 60% of all the fish eaten in Europe was cod. By 1620, the pilgrims landed on Cape Cod. And by 1640, about 300,000 tons of cod was being harvested annually on top of whatever was being harvested by the Basques prior to 1640. Um, and so, it was from 1640 until about 1960, so over 300 years, that they continued to land over 300 ton, 300,000 tons of cod annually. And then in the 1960s, changes in technology occurred. Um, one of them was factory trawlers came on the scene. And so we start to see a huge increase in catches starting about in the 1960s up from 300,000 tons to 800,000 tons in the 1960s, again, because of new technology. Just a little bit more about how important cod was. It was the mainstay of the New England economy. Again, it probably gave the colonies the material wealth they needed to actually fight for their independence. Um, and many of they even have something called a codfish aristocracy, where there's people at this time that trace their family fortune to 17th century cod fisheries. 
Um, and because of that, because of the, the wealth it brought them, people openly worshipped this fish as a symbol of their wealth. Um, some different examples. Um, there was a codfish that appeared on the official crest from the seal of the Plymouth Land Company. Um, the 1996 New Hampshire state seal pictured on the bottom of the slide has codfish on it. Um, different magazines and coins had pictures of codfish on them. And then also on the slide is a 1755 stamp for the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which has codfish on it and also the words staple of Massachusetts. Um, and so it's so important if the cod was fetishized, it was built into cultural symbolism. And also the cod fishery was considered renewable, even at really, really high rates of fishing. Um, the fishery was expected to continue to provide for at least another thousand years. Um, in 1885, the Canadian Ministry of Agriculture said, our fisheries will continue to be fertile for centuries to come unless the order of nature is overthrown. So what happened to the cod fishery? Well, in 1970, cod fishing peaked. Um, it hit an all-time high. And then shortly thereafter, it absolutely collapsed. It declined and it never came back. So if you look at the graph from 1850 to 2000, the blue line shows catch in metric tons. One metric ton is equal to 2,200 pounds. Um, and so you can see the catch right around 300 tons. Um, again, they started catching that much about 1640 up until 1960. So for several centuries, they were pulling that much out. Just for reference, um, 300,000 tons is about 660 million pounds per year. Um, and then the red line on the graph, which is a quota or a limit that was set for what people were allowed to catch. And the quota was set in 1970, shortly after um, you see the, the catch go up to 800,000 tons. Um, then the catch peaks at 800,000 tons in 1970. The quota is put into place, um, but the catch continually to rapidly decline far below the quota after this point. Within five years, the catch is below 200,000, lower than it's been in three centuries. And by 1992, no one's catching cod at all anymore. Um, again, notice the quotas put into action after 1970 to try to restrict catches and let the population rebound. Um, but it was too late. The catches essentially remain below the quota immediately and forever after. Um, not because people were conserving the fishery, but because there was no more fish left to catch. The cod were basically gone. Um, today, it's estimated that the offshore cod stocks are at about 1% of what they were in 1977. So it's still not back. Um, why the crash? What happened? One aspect is the scientific theory designed to regulate the fishery um, on which the quotas were based was ultimately flawed. Um, and so in this case, science used something called catch per unit effort to um, measure and indicate the health of the fishery. And this CPUE, catch per unit effort, is supposed to regulate um, and signal if the fishery is in trouble, but it didn't. Um, so what happened? So CPU, um, catch per unit effort, basically how much are you catching? What, how much fish are you pulling out per unit of time and effort that you're putting in? So um, how, how much work are you putting in and how much are you getting back? A really high CPUE means you're getting a high catch for not very much effort. Um, the lower the CPUE means the more effort you're putting in. Um, and the less you're getting out, right? Your catch is going down, even though your efforts are intensifying. And so when CPUE starts to decline, what that indicates is there's a problem with the fish stock. Um, it indicates that people are having to put more and more effort into fishing to pull out the same amount, uh, which means that the stock may be declining. Uh, another important thing of the assumptions of the, the model is Scientists assume fishermen will earn maximum profits at a medium level of fishing effort. Okay, so um, kind of bear with me, if you will. It's CPEU and at a low level of effort, low CPU, um, you're, not, you're not putting in a lot of effort. And so likewise, you're not really getting a lot back. Um, at a really, really high amount of effort, you're getting a little more bang for your buck, a little more for your catch, um, but at a much higher level of effort. And so the assumption is that sort of medium effort, um, you are 
achieving maximum profits. If you go into a really high effort, then you're investing more in technology and all sorts of other things. You're putting in a lot more effort for a little bit more of a return um, once the costs balance out with what you've earned. And at a really low effort, again, you're not going to get much of a return. So it's that medium level of fishing effort that maximum profits um, are predicted. Right. You put in a really high effort, you're going to get a little bit more out, but at a, at a really a much higher cost. So medium level um, is what is assumed where people are at. OK, so if the CP UE doesn't change and effort of fishing is at a medium level, it's assumed that the fishery is help, uh, healthy. It's assumed that um, they're taking out optimum sustained yield. Um, the optimum sustained yield for fishing as a whole, it means this is the largest um, economic yield, the amount of fish you can take out of a renewable population over a long period of time without decreasing the population's ability to support itself, to reproduce itself. Um, and so optimum sustained yield takes into account things like reproductive and age structure of the fish population um, because it doesn't matter just how many you're taking out. It matters what individuals you're taking out. Are you taking out reproductive adults or immature um, juveniles, right? When the, if you take out all the reproductively mature adults, that population is going to have a difficult time sustaining itself. Um, this is in contrast to maximum sustain yield, which is sort of considered the highest sustainable level of harvest. But it's often problematic because it doesn't account for reproductive or age profiles. Um, and so, again, uh, it matters what types of individuals you're taking out of the population, not just how many overall you're taking out, because it affects that population's ability to reproduce itself. OK, so the assumption is that as fishing profits drop um, because the stock, the CPU, CPUE will be dwindling. People are putting in more effort, but they're getting out even less fish, meaning their profits are dropping, dropping because their costs are still high, but their profits are low. Um, fishers will eventually go out of business. They'll switch to another job or livelihood that can support them. Um, and so the way it goes is as long as CPUE stays the same, it's assumed that the fish stock is steady. It's assumed people are fishing at a medium level of effort um, and that we're pulling out optimum sustained yield as long as CPUE is unchanging. Um, uh, unfortunately, these assumptions were incorrect. Um, this assumption that we're pulling out optimum sustained yield and that fishermen were working at a medium level of effort was not actually correct. Um, so there was flaws with the way the, the theory was structured. Um, first of all, unchanging CPUE, unchanging effort, is not a great indicator of the fish stock um, because it ignores age and reproductive structure of the population for one. But also, um, effort and yield, your CPUE could stay the same while the stock is actually dwindling. Um, how, does, how does this work? And so one problem is um, CPUE, how much they were catching compared to how much effort they were putting in, was measured using fish landing. Um, so it looks like there's still lots of fish in the ocean because they're measuring it via what is actually being pulled out um, on the docks. But the reason that there was still lots of fish being pulled out is technology had gotten better and better. If the scientists, instead of measuring fish landings to infer the health of the, the actual stock, had actually sampled the ecology, they could have seen the population was in dire straits. And so what happened is as technology advanced, um, things like fish finders emerged. Uh, fishermen efforts stayed the same because they were catching more fish more efficiently. Um, they intensified their fishing effort. They were putting in the same amount of effort, but getting even more out because technology had improved. It had made fishing fish easier to find, easier to catch. So the increased effort that should be signaled by CPUE declining, it a declining CPUE should show us that fish are becoming harder to catch. People are having putting more effort in and they're getting less out. It should show us the stock's declining, but the fishing effort didn't increase. Um, the CPUE didn't change because technology, technological efficiency, was masking this increased effort in the declining fish stock. Um, so T CPUE didn't decline because people were using more efficient technology, essentially. The scientists assumed the stock was healthy. Um, and it wasn't right. There was less cod in the ocean, but it still appeared healthy. The fishery appeared healthy because they were looking at fish landings. Um, cod fishing was shut down in 1992 and it's still not back. 
um, again, the, the stock is just gone. And increasing exploitation of the world's fisheries is not limited to the cod fishery. We're catching more fish overall today. Um, also notice from the chart how much of the total catch is illegal or bycatch versus the economic mainstays that we normally think of. And cod isn't the only fishery under threat. Um, industrial scale fishing, which is what many now practice, large scale fishing, industrial global fishing capacity could catch the world catch four times over. That means we have the technology, the capacity to catch everything um, in our oceans, not once, but four times over. And the reason why is new technologies. One major innovation was trawlers. Um, factory trawlers. For those of you that don't know what a trawler is, it's these these bottom trawlers. It's basically a big ass rake um, attached to a net, and you drag this big rake along the ocean bottom, and then there's a net that collects everything this rake scra scrapes up. The mouth of the largest trawling net in the world is big enough to accommodate 13 747 planes. Um, these things, these trawlers, destroy and rake up entire fucking ecosystems. I've seen them in the Solomon Islands. They rip up entire coral reef systems, some of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. And they're not seeking to catch most. Most of the stuff they catch is discarded, is, is wasted. Um, they're only looking for specific species, but in doing it out of efficiency and keeping their profits high, um, reducing any unnecessary costs, they rake up entire fucking ecosystems to fish. Um, other new technologies that have contributed to um, how much fish we're catching. Now we have engine, engine powered vessels, um, also frozen food storage, which allows people to take trips that are longer, um, catch more, it stays, stays fresh for longer. There's larger nets now. There's better navigation to find the fish. For example, we have sonar technology. Um, sonar was originally developed in World War II to help us locate enemy submarines. Now we apply it to finding schools of fish. Um, also, the world's long line industry. Remember, you set out these long lines with a bunch of baited hooks along it. The long lining industry sets 1.4 billion hooks every year. That's enough line to encircle the globe more than 550 times. These new technologies are vastly different from the old fishing techniques like hand lines and long lines. And if current trends continued, and they very much have been, all fish stocks could actually collapse by mid-time this century, by 2048. Um, on the graph, you see real-time and also extrapolated fisheries data. Um, this is from 1997, or th this article, this source references um, this time point at 1997, in which about 79% of the world's commercially important fish species were either fully fished, there's no more to catch, overexploited, meaning more were being taken than could ever be replaced, depleted, the stock's depleted, or slowly recovering, meaning the stock had already been hammered and now we're trying to allow it to recover. Um, and the recent, if you look at recent data, um, the picture is is this bad or worse um 2018 about 90 experts agree 90 percent of global fisheries already fully exploited um some estimate that as high as 99 percent and remember um you know if one stock who cares if sort of one fish stock goes away um well the people that rely on that fish stock might care or the eco you know for the sake of the ecosystem itself but also all these different parts of the ecosystem are interrelated Right, as these top predators like cod and tuna go, fishers are switching to less preferred fish. Seas are increasingly being dominated by species lower in the food chain. And this can induce changes in the composition of marine ecosystems. So remember, all the parts are sort of interrelated. Um, causes of increasing fishery exploitation. There's been an increased human demand for fish and the products derived from them. Um, for one, there's these touted health benefits of omega-3 fatty acids that you can get from fish oil that we now sell in supplements. Um, also changing diets in developing countries. Think China, um, countries that now eat more meat, including, including fish and seafood as they become wealthier and more affluent. Um, and, and China is one of the, the biggest uh, contributors, if you will, to industrial scale fishing. Um, 
Another reason for increased demand is 30% of the fish being caught isn't even fed to people. A lot of it is fed to other fish, right, through aquaculture. And there's also lots of bycatch um, species that are just tossed back, um, you know, dead or alive. They're caught on accident, but they're not the intended catch. There's an article I'll show you in just a minute from New York Times. 25% of China's fish that they catch goes to feeding pigs and chickens in, U in the U.S. It goes into animal feed. Um, this article is from the New York Times 2017, and it's, it's talking about Chinese fishing capacity. The picture on the top, that's a Chinese fishing fleet. Um, and note that just like corn agriculture in the U.S. is heavily subsidized by the government, so is fishing in China. Um, the fishing fleets in China wouldn't be possible without government subsidies and tax breaks. Um, and so the fishing capacity in China, this article, what they sort of talk about is it's just causing this unsustainable demand on the world's fisheries. Again, 90% are estimated to have already collapsed. China is responsible for one third of world seafood consumption, and that figure grows by 6% a year. So industrial fishing is the point of the article, industrial fishing, like what China's doing, and then selling much of that fish in, for animal feed or other really non-primary uses. Um, Industrial fishing is making it difficult for other people around the world that depend on the seas for their livelihoods to subsist. And so uh, the article takes us all the way over to the African coast in Senegal. And they're talking to this 52 year old villager. It said, when I was a kid, I used to dip my net and there was too many fish coming out. You didn't know what to do with all of it. Now the seas are empty. Um, and one of the reasons for that, the reason for that is industrial scale fishing capacity, China being an excellent example of that. And so if fisheries around the world are declining, there must be something about how industrial fisheries are structured that's flawed, um, because this really didn't become a problem until we started fishing in an industrial capacity. We're taking too much out, essentially. Um, and so one of the problems um, with the way we have things set up now is the typical method to restrict fishing to try to, to protect the stock is quotas, um, limiting how much people can take out at a certain time of the season. And so setting limits on what appears to be sustainable is problematic for reasons we already discussed, right? Like if the science is flawed, um, if they're not accounting for the role of improving technology in their models, um, they might be missing what they're trying to measure. Um, but there's other flaws also. And so one, one thing we're looking at here is the way the system is structured um, drives the outcomes. So can, is there a way to change the way we're doing it, the way it's structured to change the incentives and therefore change the outcomes, make fishing more sustainable? Um, and so with quotas, the result is you have um, a short open fishing season in which you can catch so many fish, um, you can fill your quota and then that's it. And the result is everyone in hopes of filling their quota um, and staying whole as a fisherman. Fishermen, just like the farmer, corn farmers, are not evil people. Um, they're, they're not wealthy for the most part either. They're barely staying whole. Um, so you have these quotas. Everyone goes out fishing at the exact same time to try to get their catch, get their quota, um, and get back and sell it. Um, the incentives are for individuals to go out, to race to the fish, right? And, and each rational individual, therefore, all does this. Um, because if you don't, right, everyone else is going to beat you to it. There'll be no fish left for you. So everyone races out to the fish. Um, they try to catch the biggest, fattest fish, which are also typically the most reproductively mature ones, which are important to the overall health of the stock. Um, fishermen tend to take more risks. They'll go out when there's bad weather or uh, the, just the climate is not is dangerous, um, but that's when they're allowed to go via the quota, via the government regulation. Um, and if they, they don't go, they know everyone else is going. Um, and so they're going to be empty handed. Um, another result is because of this race to the fish to try to compete, beat everyone else out so that you can fill your quota and stay in business. The fishermen are always investing in more equipment and new technology, much like the chicken farmers, right, that we saw in Food Inc. And so they're always in more debt, um, always broke. 
And then on top of it, because everyone races to the fish during this short open fishing season, then they come back and everyone sells their catch on the market at the same time. This depresses the prices that you can get for your catch. Everyone's selling it at the same time. Um, so how can one, one alternative, and there's lots of literature on this if you're interested, one alternative is change the way we're doing it to, in order to change the incentives so that the result will be more sustainable. Um, so one example is something called catch shares for each boat. So the idea is um, that not everyone has to go out at the same time, that each boat owns a percentage of the catch. So instead of everyone going out at once, each boat receives a share. Um, this allows fishermen to wait until the weather the weather is better. Um, there's no incentive to sort of get out there first or catch the fish first because everyone's going to get a share from every boat. And so a really, really um, rough hypothetical just to kind of explain what I mean by this. Say you have boat A and let's say they catch 100 fish. Um, and then you have boat B and let, they're a smaller boat. And let's say they catch um, 50 fish. But they go out at a later time. So boat A goes out and catches their 100 fish. Boat B, C, D, they're waiting because they're going to get a share of that and they're going to get their chance. Um, there's no reason now to sort of race to the fish because of catch shares. So boat A comes back with their 100 fish. Again, this is overly simplified hypothetical. And they let's say um, they give 10%, 10 fish to boat B. That's the arranged catch share. Now, remember boat B is smaller. They're going to go out and catch 50 fish. Um, and when they come back, they're going to give 10 of those fish, about 20% of their catch, to boat A, who gave them 10 fish, 10% um, of their catch. And so in the end, the, the end result is everyone still gets the same amount of fish, but they get a different share from each boat. And so everyone's not racing out to go at the same time. There's no need to bring the fish in first because you're going to get a share from each boat. Fishermen don't have to invest in new equipment to try to beat each other out. They don't have to go out during dangerous weather to try to compete with each other because there's catch shares. Um, it gives incentives. The incentives are different. Um, it, it The fish stock's not getting hammered all at one time, um, but rather over time um, by different boats, right? Taking a little bit as they go. Um, helps protect, protect the stock. And it's also better for the fishermen. Another result is by doing catch shares, all the fish don't come to market at the same time and you can get a higher price for your catch also. So this is one example of a potential alternative in terms of how we structure and set things up to get different outcomes. Um, the way we do things is not inevitable. A lot of it is based off profit, individual profits. We can change the system. We can set it up differently. Pelagic fisheries, these deep sea fisheries like the cod fishery, are one of the more difficult common pool resources to manage. In many cases, in many ways, this example supports Hardeen's theory of the tragedy of the commons. Um, but in other contexts, Hardeen's tragedy has not occurred. There's several sort of flaws or assumptions that go into his model that are it's important we understand. So first, um, not all common pool resources are necessarily open access. Just because it looks open, like a, a lake or a fishery or a forest or pasture land or grazing land, um, common pool resource does not mean open access. Um, and so we have to distinguish between resource type and property regime. It's not the same thing. The resource type, the fishery, um, may be open access or it might be accompanied by a common property regime, um, meaning that it's actually managed in some way. So the resource type and the property regime that accompanies it are not the same. We have to distinguish between the two. Um, many resources that might look open access to Westerners, again, are actually managed by community, communal property regimes. The access is regulated and the use is sustainable, even though it might look to us like it's open to all. Um, so he failed to distinguish between open access and common pooled resources. Another problem with the model is privatization of resources or national government regulation of them doesn't seem to assure sustainable use by any means. Um, for example, the national regulation of the cod fishery, the, the quotas based off science. Um, in this case, the science was flawed. It didn't work. 
Um, another example of problems with national regulation to protect our resources, under the Trump administration, again, about 60 something out of 80 different environmental protection acts that go back to the 50s, I'm talking Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, are being um, dismantled, um, just gotten rid of. Um, it's, it's considered uh, an unnecessary burden and cost to businesses. So privatization, uh, nationalization doesn't assure sustainability. And in terms of privatization, again, um, the assumption is that people own it and so they'll care for it. Um, think about mon mine, mining companies, logging companies that just come in and strip the resources and go. Um, they're not interested in sustainable resource use. Um, they, they might be, but in many cases, they're not. So these two solutions aren't necessarily solutions. And another thing, Hardeen made a poor choice in choosing the medieval English commons as his example. Um, he used sort of member the herdsmen grazing on pasture land to illustrate tragedy of the commons. Well, the medieval English commons were not degraded by common resource use, um, common pooled resource use. It was actually when wool production started to become profitable in England that certain individuals started something called the Enclosure Acts and they began privatizing different sects of the grazing land. Privatization is what led to the degradation of the commons in this case, um, not common property use. So sort of a poor choice for to use as his main example as well. And so Hardeen, he failed to distinguish between common property regimes and open access. So again, common property regimes are institutions that manage resources collectively. The resource is not the same as the property regime. The resource could be the fishery or the lake. Um, it might look open access or unregulated, but in many cases, such as in the example of Lake Titicaca, it's not. Um, the, the lake, the fisheries are regulated by the community, the lakes, uh, the lakeshore villagers in this institution called TERFs, Territorial Use Rights and Fishing, where each village has access to their own sort of area of the sea. Um, they manage this resource, the lake, collectively. It's a group of organized people, an institution that manages resources collectively. And so there's many cases around the world where these institutions, local communities, groups of people that are organized, do sustainably manage resources. Um, we've been reading about TERFs in uh, the lakeshore uh, villages around Lake Titicaca in Ben Orlov's book. Um, Hardeen's idea was so influential that there's this deeply ingrained idea in Western culture that common property automatically results in ruin, environmental destruction. Um, and so from the article you read, the author says, community institutions for managing local resources have great potential in the design of conservation strategies, if properly understood how they work. Thus, conservation interventions that work on capacity building should pay attention to the institutions already in place how they could be strengthened and shaped to achieve new goals. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you have all these conservationists, outsiders, experts, scientists, the government coming in trying to regulate local villagers around Lake Titicaca when they already have a sustainable community-based property regime that regulates resource use on the lake. And it's a great example of long-term sustainable resource use. Um, but these local institutions, these community-based practices, they're often overlooked. They're not even seen. They're invisible to Western society um, to the detriment of the local people and often successful conservation. Um, remember that example from Orla, that scientist that was hired to spend six months researching Lake Titicaca, and he spent less than a month and wrote an 18-page piece of shit report about it in which he said the locals need to be closely regulated because they're messy and disorganized. Um, again, these community-based institutions are often invisible to Western society. Um, God forbid, right, the people actually manage the resources they use. This is just a foreign idea to many of us. So recall our four basic types of property regimes. Just a few more things uh, before we wrap up today. Open access, common property, private property, and state property, meaning government or nationalized. Community-based resource management, which is a type of a common property regime, is an alternative to open access, government regulation, or private property that works in some cases. Again, certain things have to be in place. Um, and again, I just want to say one more time, we have to distinguish between the resource type, the fishery, the forest, the pasture commons, oil, which is not the same as the property regime. Right? Resources that are subject to the tragedy 
It depends on the property regime regulating the resource, right? So even though a fishery might seem susceptible, it might seem open access, it may not be as is in the case of Lake Titicaca. And so community-based resource management can be effective. It has to have certain characteristics in place for it to work. And this is sort of where we left off before exam two. Um, so again, I won't ask you specifically about these. The main point is to know certain things have to be in place for it to work. There has to be boundaries that everyone can define. Um, benefits and costs have to be equitably distributed. And everyone involved needs to be able to participate to contribute to decision making um, and to, to benefit from it as well. Otherwise, there's no reason to respect the system. Um, and so there, one interesting point is that small scale societies tend to be more conducive to community based resource management because small scale societies align with the necessary characteristics for CBRM to work. So what I mean is they're small scale. Um, you have face to face communication. Everyone in the community sort of knows everyone. This is true in Solomon Islands, which is the, what the picture on the slide is. Um, everyone knows everyone. So you can monitor each other. People know when other people are violating the rules and they can correct for this. Also, the cultural norms and values that tend to accompany small-scale societies uh, tend to involve the humanization process. Again, the driving force in these societies is making sure everyone's needs are met rather than accruing endless individual profit. And so in these systems, you forego maybe a little bit of individual profit, but in the long term, this is good for the individual and the group because it ensures sustainable resource use. It only works if everyone cooperates. And so again, this might be one reason why this management strategy is conducive in small scale societies, um, where making sure people's needs are met is the driving process rather than commercialization for profit business being the main incentive driving people's motives. Um, again, seeking your own individual interest is that is not a human trait. That's a culturally instituted trait, um, an American value and a great many cultures value quite the opposite. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. And so where we're headed is what has conservation policy and, and projects actually look like? Um, what types of projects have been imposed in terms of national parks and other reserves by Western society? And what's been the result? Has it worked? Um, if the goal is conserving biodiversity, have we actually done that? And the answer is kind of no. And there's also been some other consequences to the way that we've done things because of the assumptions that have gone into um, how we've approached conservation.